Today we're talking about the message of Habakkuk, and before I begin, I just want to draw your attention. I'm sure you've already seen it in our bulletin to this uh, piece here, this insert in your bulletin. The book of Habakkuk in poetry, the entire book set to poetry, written by one of our own members, Kathleen Kelly, and uh, she did this back in 2005, 2006. But uh, I knew she had done this, so I printed it up and put it in the bulletin. I really consider this a masterpiece. It, it beautifully captures the, the sense of what's going on in Habakkuk and also puts it in, in a poetic form that's just beautiful. So I, I encourage you to keep that. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about the key verse in the book of Habakkuk. It's chapter 2, verse 4. And, and it says, See, he is puffed up, his desires are not upright, but the righteous will live by his faith. Now, this version says faithfulness. The old New International Version that I'm reading uh, says uh, by his faith, and that's a good way to go. Now, this key verse, Habakkuk 2.4, is quoted three times in the New Testament. The first is Romans 1.17. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, and then see the quotation marks. Here comes Habakkuk 2.4. The righteous will live by faith. The second place it's quoted is in Galatians 3.11. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because, and then here's the quotation from Habakkuk 2.4, the righteous will live by faith. And then the third time is Hebrews 10.38. But my righteous one will live by faith. That's the reference there to Habakkuk. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. Now, these three Bible books that quote our key verse, Romans, Galatians and Hebrews correspond to the three key phrases in our key verse, Habakkuk 2.4. The three key phrases are, the righteous will live by faith. Romans tells us who the righteous are. They are people who trust in Christ. And so Romans is the first book in the New Testament that quotes our key verse today. The second book that quotes it is Galatians, and Galatians corresponds to that second phrase, will live, because Galatians tells us how people come to new life in Christ, how they come to, to live, and it's by trusting in Christ. And then the third phrase, by faith, is represented in the book of Hebrews, the key phrase of which is by faith. Those two words, by faith, are found 23 times in the 11th chapter of Hebrews alone. And the 11th chapter of Hebrews tells us how uh, the Old Testament saints endured through the trials they suffered. They did it by faith. And so these three New Testament books quote Habakkuk 2.4, and each one in succession highlights in its own theme uh, in the New Testament, one of the key, the three key phrases in Habakkuk 2.4. Habakkuk 2.4 was the motto of Martin Luther 500 years ago. <clears throat> Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic monk who was trying to earn his salvation by doing all the things that the uh, Roman Catholic Church said uh, you should do. And then he read Romans 1.17, which he knew was a quotation of Habakkuk 2.4. The righteous will live by faith. And it dawned on Martin Luther 500 years ago. It dawned on him. Hey, I'm going to live with God by faith. 
not by all these works that the Roman Catholic Church is telling me to do. And he was a monk himself. And so he resigned from the Roman Catholic Church completely. And he wrote up what we call 95 theses. They were really 95 protests against Roman Catholic teaching that boiled down to you have to do this and do that or you're not going to make it to heaven. And, and he, he protested against the Roman Catholic teachings of salvation by works. And this touched off what we call the Protestant Reformation, which, which we are a part of today as a Protestant church. And Martin Luther said that Habakkuk 2.4, this word-for-word -word quote, was for me the gate into paradise. We consider Martin Luther a hero of the church for igniting the Protestant Reformation. All right, now we're going to deal with three main topics here in the book, or in our study of Habakkuk, and the first is the remarks on it. Now, <clears throat> let me just start by saying the, uh, the book is pronounced a bunch of different ways, but there really is only one correct pronunciation, and that is to say Habakkuk. Now, when I was a boy and I learned the books of the Bible by memory, I would recite it as Habakkuk. And I, you know, sometimes hear people say Habakkuk or they say something else. You know, it's kind of hard to pronounce. But when you say the title of this book, think of your back. Habakkuk. That, that's how you pronounce it, Habakkuk. So that's the pronunciation. All right, Habakkuk is the only book in the Bible completely addressed to God and not to people. From beginning to end, it's a prayer, the only book in the Bible that is that way. It was written about 600 BC. And Habakkuk's name means embracer. And it speaks of how he wrestled with God. And he didn't wrestle with God literally like Jacob did in Genesis, but he wrestled with God over these, these tough questions he had to ask God. We'll come to those in a moment. And then uh, this book begins with a sob and ends with a song. That's a good way to look at it. All right, so much for the remarks on this book. Now let's talk about the review of it. Here's an outline of the book for you. Two parts. Number one, Habakkuk's two protests in chapters one and two. So his first protest is in chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. And his protest boils down to this. How can God let people get away with sin? Now we're going to read this first protest in verses 2 to 4 of chapter 1. But before we read that, let me say that the people who were getting away with sin in Habakkuk's mind and shouldn't have been were God's own people, the southern kingdom of Judah. So now let's read verses 2 through 4. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. See, violence was taking place and God wasn't doing anything about it. Why do you make me look at injustice while you tolerate wrong, Habakkuk is saying, I can't tolerate this injustice I see going on, Lord. How, how can you tolerate it? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict uh, abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. So let me... Uh, point out to you now the specific sins here that Habakkuk just couldn't understand how God could just do nothing about. One is violence. You see that there in line two. Injustice. I think that's line four. Wrongdoing right below line four. And then next to that, destruction and violence. Underneath, strife, conflict, and they were abounding a paralysis of the law, 
and justice was never prevailing, so he was living with injustice. The wicked were hemming in the righteous, and then finally at the end, a perversion of justice. So Habakkuk just couldn't figure out how God would let these things happen. And we have similar conditions today. In our society, murder is rampant. Families are breaking down. Some businesses have no sense of morality. Some judges take bribes and show no remorse when uh, they're caught. Now Malachi, in the last book of the Old Testament, had a similar question in Malachi 2.17. Where is the God of justice? And the implied answer in Malachi's mind and also in Habakkuk's mind is nowhere. We don't see the God of justice today. Now, we still ask this question. Where was the God of justice on 9-11? When Osama bin Laden and his Al-Qaeda terrorist network crashed four jumbo jets filled with innocent American passengers that day. Two into the World Trade Center, one into the Pentagon, and one into a Pennsylvania field. How could God let such an injustice happen? <clears throat> um, here is a uh, newspaper article I cut out of the newspaper a couple of years ago. The um, the headline reads, Pedophile's Sentence Overturned Because Judge Cited the Bible. Let me read this to you. A rapist's 51-year prison sentence has been overturned on appeal because the judge turned to the Bible while deciding the punishment. The appeals court ruled that James Arnett can seek a lesser sentence. Arnett, 33, was sentenced 13 months ago for raping and molesting his fiance's eight-year-old daughter. In weighing Arnett's sentence, Judge Melba Marsh said she turned to the Bible and read a verse in Matthew that said anyone who offends a child would be better off if a millstone were hanged around his neck and that he was drowned in the depths of the sea. The appeals court, in a two-to-one decision, concluded that Marsh acted outside of Ohio's sentencing guidelines by using the Bible to determine Arnett's fate. And so his, here he is a rapist and a pedophile, and his sentence is overturned. That is injustice for you. Here's an issue of Discipleship Journal from a couple of years ago, and they asked their readers to write in with examples of things they had lived through which were an injustice in their own lives. I'll read to you two of them. Uh, they're both pretty brief here. But um, the first one is written by a young mother and wife. She writes, When my son was two, his father called me from work one day to let me know he would not be coming home he had found another place to live with his girlfriend, as I discovered later. I began to feel angry at having been stolen from. I was angry at having to do it, to do it all by myself, raising my child, bringing home the money to pay bills, making all the decisions. I felt used up, rejected, and discarded. I felt rage on behalf of my son, who was innocent in all of this. And here's what another person wrote in and said. In the fall of 1991, a drunk driver lost control of his car and collided with our minivan, killing my mother, my wife, and one of my daughters. Because of a legal technicality, he was found not guilty. Well, yeah, there's, we, we all live with some measure of injustice, don't we? Maybe you're a very good employee where you work and you deserved to get that promotion, but you did not get it and you're convinced the reason you didn't get it was maybe that you're a female or that the, your skin 
is the wrong color, and that's why you didn't get the promotion. Or take the case of uh, a boy who's on, let's say, a baseball team, and he's a good athlete, and he deserves to play. He's earned his position out there on the field, but he is not out there in the field. He is sitting the bench, and you know why he's sitting the bench? Some, sometimes this can happen. Because the coach wants to get his own son into the game. And that's not, not fair. Now, so Habakkuk says to God, how can you let all this injustice take place? Now, here's God's reply. And I'm paraphrasing here, but this is the sense of it. Yes, I will punish Judah by means of the Babylonians. Now, this is spelled out in chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. Let's look at it. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwelling places not their own. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like a vulture swooping to devour. They come bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They deride kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities. They build earthen ramps and capture them. Then they sweep past like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own strength is their God. Well, this leads now to Habakkuk's second protest. It's in chapter 1, 12 through chapter 2, 1, and, and I'm going to paraphrase his protest now. How can God use the Babylonians to punish the people of Judah when the Babylonians are more wicked than the people of Judah? All right, let's read about this now in chapter 1, 12 through chapter 2, verse 1. Oh, Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, we will not die. Oh, Lord, you have appointed them to execute judgment? The, the Babylonians of all people? Oh, Rock, you have ordained them to punish? Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous, the Babylonians? Why are you silent while the wicked the Babylonians, swallow up those more righteous than themselves, the Jews. You have made men like fish in the sea, like sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with the hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his dragnet, and so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his nets, net and burns incense to his dragnet. For by his net he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. So he, he himself calls it a complaint against God. Habakkuk was horrified to hear that God said he would use Babylon to punish Judah. And so his second question was even more baffling than the first one. Now let me show you, just remind you from God's description of the Babylonians earlier of what kind of people they were. They were ruthless and impetuous people, chapter 1, verse 6. They are a law to themselves, chapter 1, verse 7. They come bent on violence, chapter 1, verse 9. They are guilty men whose own strength is their God, chapter 1, verse 11. So this was a daring question that Habakkuk was raising because he was questioning if God's actions were right. A very dangerous thing to do with God. Now here is God's reply. I will use the Babylonians not because they are righteous, but because they are my temporary instruments of judgment. And he goes on in the rest of chapter 2 to show how Babylon also will be judged. 
I want to point out to you five woes on Babylon. Chapter 2, verse 6. Will not all of them taunt him with ridicule and scorn, saying, here it is, woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Verse 9. Woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain, setting his nest on high to escape the clutches of ruin. Verse 12. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice. That's what the Babylonians were doing. Verse 15. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbors, pouring it from the wineskin that they are drunk till they are drunk, so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. And verse 19. Woe to him who says to the wood, Come to life, or to lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? Is it covered with gold? It is covered with gold and silver. There's no breath in it. The Babylonians made idols. And God says, woe to them for this. Okay, so there you have the, the first half of the book, Habakkuk's uh, two protests. Now, this, the second half is in chapter 3, and I call that Habakkuk's two prayers. And the first one is this, a prayer of reverence in verses 1 through 15. Now, what this boils down to, here's my paraphrase of verses 1 through 15. Habakkuk will let God be God. He won't question God anymore. Now, in chapter 3, we read verse 1, A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. And he's implying there, I'm not going to question them anymore. I'm just going to stand in in awe of them. Renew them in our day, implied not, Lord, how can you do this, but they are good, and so renew them in our day and in our time. Make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise, rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Plague went before him. Pestilence followed his steps. Here he is admiring God for his awesome ways. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapsed. His ways are eternal. I saw the tents of Kushan in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Were you angry with the rivers, O Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode with your horses and your victorious chariots? You uncovered your bow. You called for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by. The deep roared and, its, and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, and this is God's people in the days of Moses, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness that was Pharaoh in Egypt. You stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear you pierced his head when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, chasing them after they had left Egypt. Gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding, you trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. And that's where the Egyptians died in, in, in the Red Sea there. So, um, the question comes up then, how did Habakkuk get to this point? He's been complaining to God about seeming injustice. He had two big protests. How is it now that he says, I'm just going to revere God? And I think the answer is our key verse, chapter 2, verse 4, the righteous will live by faith. Habakkuk came to this point by faith. All right, and then finally, his second prayer is a prayer of rejoicing in chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. We'll read it now. I heard and my heart pounded, my lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come upon the nation invading us. 
Though the fig tree does not bud, and though there are no grapes on the vines, this is a good verse for us in our drought, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are, there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. So, um, Habakkuk will rejoice in God no matter what happens. That's my summation of verses 16 through 19. Again, we come to the question, how did he get to this point? From arguing with God to finally saying, well, no matter what happens, I'm going to rejoice in God. He got to that point by faith. Remember the key verse, chapter 2, verse 4, the righteous will live by faith. Habakkuk still had not seen God judge Judah. He wrote this book around 600 BC and judgment on Judah came in 586 BC when the Babylonians took them into captivity. But God had spoken. Habakkuk didn't need to see his prayers answered. It was enough for him that God had spoken. And this is all that faith requires that God's, God has spoken. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it says, we live by faith, not by sight. And so the book of Habakkuk ends with the author who had been full of questions, rejoicing in God. All right, now, finally, let's talk about the relevance to this book. I want to show you seven ways that this book applies to us. Number one, don't be afraid to ask God tough questions. But make sure you don't accuse God of injustice. Uh, don't give up on God. And also be prepared to accept God's answers, even though they may be distasteful for you like they were for Habakkuk. He, he rested in God anyway by faith. Here are, here are two questions Christians ask today. These are samples. Some Christians say, God, does hell really have to be eternal with no chance for remedial getting out? Uh, people, okay, so people go to hell because they need to be punished for their sins, but Punished forever? Doesn't that sound a little too stiff, God? If you wrestle with that, how, how, do you, how do you arrive at peace? Here's how you arrive at peace. By faith. The just shall live by faith. You, ju you, you just trust God even if you can't understand it. And really, I don't think any of us can understand that. Here's, here's another example of, of how people argue with God and ask him tough questions, like Habakkuk did. They say... God, my husband died of cancer when he was 37 years old, and, and he was a godly man. I look around and I see other men my husband's age who are not walking with the Lord at all, and they're in perfect health. That just doesn't seem fair, God. Why did my husband have to be taken and these other men get to live? Why, why isn't life fair? And okay, you know, that's a tough question, all right. And, and I, I don't blame you for asking that question. But the only way you're really going to arrive at a measure of peace over that is by faith. The just shall live, the righteous shall live by faith. Key verse in Habakkuk. You've, you, you've just got to trust God even when you can't understand it. Here's a second lesson that comes out of the book. Don't judge God by appearances on earth. History has meaning if we study it with the eye of faith. And I like to sometimes pronounce the word history this way. His story. That's what history is. It's God's story. Sometimes it doesn't 
make any sense to us. But again, we come back to the key verse, 2-4. The righteous will live by his faith. Here's a third lesson. Have I grieved over the sins of my country? That's what Habakkuk did in chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, when he asked God, how can you let your people get away with all these sins? And some of our country's notorious sins today are the legalization of abortion and also uh, the legalization of same-sex marriage. We need to grieve over these sins. Here's a fourth lesson. God controls the greatest earthly powers. Babylon had recently conquered Assyria and Egypt, and then they were about to take God's people into captivity, but Babylon would also have to answer to God. And this is good news when we think today of evil earthly powers like North Korea, Afghanistan, the Al-Qaeda terrorist network, and so forth. Just a couple of days ago, just this week on the national news, maybe you saw it and I saw it on TV, they were showing how the president of Afghanistan, like four or th three or four days ago, released 25 people from prison whom the United States considers 25 of the most dangerous people in the world. And our president and everybody else protested and said to the president of Afghanistan, don't release those people. This is crazy. crazy. He released them anyway. Injustice. How, how can God let presidents and nations get away with things like that? Well, all we can say is God knows what he's doing and the righteous will we'll live by faith. We keep coming back to that. All right, here's a uh, fifth lesson out of the book. We need to wait reverently and silently on God in prayer. In chapter 1, verse 2, he says, How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? So Habakkuk was waiting for God to answer, and God wasn't answering. And then in chapter 2, verse 20, he says, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Well, here, here's an illustration of waiting for you. I would like to introduce you now to the dog I had when I was a boy. His, his, Poe. Now, that's not really Poe. But Poe looked exactly like that. Poe was a border collie, and I just looked up border collie on the internet and found this picture. And that's exactly what my dog Poe looked like. He was born in our garage, and he lived in our home till the day he died. And I was a boy when he was born, and a late teenager when he died. This dog was my best friend, and I was his best friend. He even slept in my bed every night. Well, Poe and I had this trick. Poe was very smart. And we had this thing going where I would take a dog biscuit and put it on his snout and say, now don't wait until I tell you it's okay, Poe. And his eyes would get cross-eyed looking at the, the dog biscuit on his snout here, you know. And only until I said, okay, Poe, then he would jerk his head up, the dog biscuit would go in the air, and he would catch it in his mouth and chew it. And I remember one year when I was in high school, we had the youth group over from church for a New Year's Eve party. So our home was jam-packed with teenagers my age and so forth. And I thought I'd demonstrate this to them. So I brought Poe in and had, I said, sit. He would sit. And then I put this dog biscuit on his beak. And, and I said to everybody, now, I, I want you to tell him it's okay. He can, he can eat it. You know? And so they said, okay, Poe, go ahead. You know, it's all right. You can eat it. And they came up real close to him, like getting right in his face. It's all right, boy, go ahead. You can eat that biscuit. And, and Poe he didn't look at them. He didn't look at me. He just looked cross-eyed right at that biscuit on his mouth. And then, after having fun teasing all my friends, 
for a minute or so, whatever. I said, okay, Poe. And he threw that biscuit up and he caught it in his mouth. And it, it was a fun game to show for my friends there on New Year's Eve that night. Now, the reason I tell that story is <clears throat> many times when you and I wait on God to give the go-ahead in our lives, we feel like Poe because all the other voices in the world are saying, go ahead, it's all right, do it now. Don't wait, this is the time. And God is saying, this is not the time. I am not answering your prayer yet. I want you to wait on me. Habakkuk had to, had to wait for God and sometimes uh, we do too. Lesson number six. <clears throat> Knowing God doesn't automatically solve all our problems. We must take our frustrations to him in prayer as Habakkuk did. A vision of Christ's lordship will dispel our problems. Is Christ your Lord? Habakkuk provides for us a model of the prayer of faith. Once God has spoken, it believes God, whatever else it may see. And then the seventh and final lesson of the day here is this. When life seems unfair, you can still rejoice in God. And this comes out in that closing prayer in verses 17 through 19 of chapter 3. We've already read it once where he says, you know, though there aren't any sheep in the pen and, you know, no crops. And so I'll, I'll still rejoice in God. So for you and me, what are you supposed to do when you don't get that promotion you deserve? When people like Casey Anthony get away with murdering their children, Kaylee Anthony, remember that in the recent past? Everybody knows Casey Anthony murdered her little girl, Kaylee, and yet she was found not guilty. How do we live with injustice like that? Habakkuk's message is that evil will be judged in God's time which is not our time. And in the midst of injustice, by faith, we can still rejoice in our God. And that takes us back to the key verse, chapter two, verse four, the righteous will live by faith. So what adverse circumstance are you living with? Maybe rebellious children, or a dysfunctional marriage, a divorce you're going through and you don't want to go through, or failing health, or maybe a sudden and unexpected death in your family. Just doesn't seem fair. Whatever it is, by faith, choose to rejoice in God anyway. I'm gonna close by reading you this story that I photocopied out of Decision Magazine, put out by the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. This is a personal uh, testimony written by a woman named Lynn Johnson. Listen to this. The impending surgery frightened me. Several tests during the course of a year had not revealed the reason for my abnormal bleeding, so my gynecologist had ordered surgery. Weighing on my emotions was the possibility of cancer, especially with my family history. I had watched my mother die of cancer. To complicate my situation as a self-employed freelance writer and editor, I have no paid sick days and no savings. My doctor told me to expect to be unable to work for about six weeks and then to work only half time for an additional six weeks. The prospect of little income for three months overwhelmed me and the thought of being fairly helpless grated against my independent nature. As the day of the surgery drew closer, I gravitated during my quiet time to the book of Psalms and to Old Testament prayers especially portions in which the writer cried out to God, why, O Lord? But one truth kept haunting me, the prophet Habakkuk's statement of willful rejoicing in the Lord, no matter what happened around him. He knew that the Babylonians would overtake his country and ravage the land, but that knowledge did not weaken his faith. And now she quotes from that closing 
prayer of rejoicing. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. I tried to follow Habakkuk's example. When I thought about the possibility of cancer, I focused my thoughts most of the time on God's power to heal, and I rejoiced in the Lord instead of worrying. When I contemplated spending three nights in the hospital, I thought about God's presence with me no matter where I was, and I rejoiced in the Lord. When I looked at my dwindling bank account balance, I thanked God for his past provisions, and again, I rejoiced in him. The surgery revealed a benign cyst. The hospital stay passed quickly. When I was home again, friends brought meals, did my laundry, cleaned my house, and ran errands for me. Someone anonymously donated enough money to make my mortgage payment one month when I didn't have enough money. And I discovered that depend depending on others is not so bad after all. I am still learning to be joyful in God my Savior. Each time that my life gets out of control or that difficulties threaten to bury me, God brings to my mind Habakkuk's statement. Praising God comes more quickly and more naturally now, although I still sometimes give in briefly to despair. And in the process of my willful rejoicing in God, God is steadying my faith in him as well as proving that the Old Testament is not outdated. And that's the message of Habakkuk for you.